So I want you to close your eyes, all of you, close your eyes. And imagine that in your right hand, that you feel half of a very juicy, fresh lemon. Also the girl that is now writing, please stop writing or drawing. Close your eyes. Yes, I know it's uncomfortable. And imagine that in your right hand, you have half of a juicy, fresh, thick lemon. And bring the lemon to your nose. And imagine that fresh, juicy lemon smell. And now take a bite and start chewing <laughs> on the lemon. <laughs> and you probably experience a sensation in your body. Open your eyes because there's no lemon. <laughs> Simply because of, a <laughs> of, an Im of imagination. You sent uh, an image to your mind. And that sends a sensation to your body. And so it's a very simple exercise of what imagination is. Okay. This is episode one of season two of Diversity Stories, a podcast by Studium Generale Artes. Welcome to this podcast. And as you hear, we are now in English. So all the internationals can enjoy as well. And it's going to be monthly, so we have a regular schedule as well. And we hope you enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Your hosts are Mel. Hi. And me, Henrike. So Mel, you're a student at Artes. I am. I study creative writing. What's that about? Oh, God, what a question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's um, being a writer in the most um, broad sense, basically. Interesting. And what do you do? Uh, I'm a student at IME, the International Master Artist Educator. And it's a master that aims to produce artists that are advocates of change. Interesting. <laughs> so this year, home is the theme of... Um, all the events hosted by Studium Generale. And uh, there was uh, an event in Zwolle at November 8. And the central question was, how can you approach and welcome the other? And during this day, artists, scholars and students explored this theme of home and citizenship together. And this first item is by Raja El Muhandis, who hosted the event. And this is a part of her introductory lecture. Let me start with, um, with my story. My name is Raja, Raja al Muhandis. And Raja means stronger than hope, in between of will and hope. And they call me a creative, they call me a musical pioneer. And I am a North African, I am an immigrant, I am a Muslim, and I am a European, and I belong to the world. And so I want to share these three life lessons with you. And the reason why I want to do that is because I hope that somewhere out there, someone who's, who's here or maybe watching through the live stream, um, who might be the, the next poet, Rumi, or Feirouz, or Van Gogh, or Banksy, or, or whoever they want to be. And they might have a similar background as I do, and they might not. And I hope that all of you will decide to use art as something that inspires you or as a life rope and to go for it. It could be any one of you. And you know, you're in the Mecca, you're at Artes. So what I really want to instill in you is, is the commitment to your art. So here's the first lesson. You got to know your past because you can only determine your future if you know where you come from. I was born in Ladeish. It's a coastal northern town in Morocco, close to Spain. And when I was nine months old, we moved to Amsterdam. My father lived there. He lived there as a guest worker at a factory at Philips. 
He was smart with his, with his, with his hands. And life has been a remarkable journey ever since. When I was three, my parents divorced. And after spending nine months in a shelter, we moved to another part of Amsterdam, Amsterdam West. And from then on, I was raised by my mother. And my mother, Habiba, Habiba means sweetheart. She was a very, very brave woman. Uh, she raised five kids all, all by herself. And she did that while she couldn't read or write in a completely strange country without any family supporting her. So she felt really alone. And why she did that is because she did something unimaginable. And she used her imagination to be able to do that. Because she divorced my dad in 1982. I don't know if, I think most of you weren't born yet. <laughs> OK, so back in the days in 1982, my mom divorced my dad. And this was only possible because we lived in the Netherlands. In Morocco, women were only allowed to divorce by law in 2004. So I grew up seeing her as a divorcee. She was shunned by her siblings in the community. She was struggling in a new country, unable to read or write. And Allah was her only witness and support. And so raising a kid like me was a challenge. <laughs> Because not only did we carry a colonial past, family trauma, and did we come from a tribal culture where family life was number one and a woman didn't divorce, but I was obsessed with dance and playing classical music and writing poems and I composed songs. I needed my own space away from my family circle to cope with not having an identity or a father or roots. And then one day, the unthinkable happened to us and to me. My mom told me that I had to give up music. She wanted to bring me back to reality. She wanted to ground me. She wanted to bring me closer to our family values and our cultural traditions. But I didn't let her. I didn't allow her to do that. I couldn't let go of my passion, my coping mechanism, my dreams. I couldn't let go of my life rope. Too much had been already taken away from me already. And so I left and closed that door for good. It's been almost 24 years now since that summer day when I was 15. And the impact this change had on me was massive. My childhood stopped right there. And in a way it was karmic because my mom married and became a mother when she was 15. And the moment I left, it, I knew it was the painful birth of my dream, my destiny. And I learned to stay strong and beat bullies with creative talent, with patience and with perseverance. Because when you dare to live your dreams, you have to pay the price that comes with it. A ballerina doesn't complain about her dancing feet. Muhammad Ali didn't complain about the punches huh, that come with boxing and being the greatest at that. The pain and hard work is the metaphor for the mandala work that Buddhist monks have mastered so well. It's like plowing the earth where no one has before. And this work is hard and it's painful, but it's work that has to be done to pave the way for others, for the next generation. Because art is a catalyst. It's the grammar we use to tell stories like mine, an immigrant forming a new identity, and maybe like yours, European young students trying to understand your identity in a changing society. So that was lesson one. Let me say that again, know your past, because you can only determine your future if you, know, if you know where you come from. Lesson two, learn from each other's experiences so you can overcome, understand, and show empathy. So see one, so once upon a time in North Africa, if I go back one generation, my ancestors, they were superheroes. My Moroccan great-grandfather was a superhero because he fled from Beni Elehem in the Eastern Atlas Mountains to Edmam in the Rif Mountains by horse and by foot. So you need to be a superhero to, to do that. And so he ended up in an insulated place, 1400 meters up in the mountains, the Rif Mountains, to hide from the French occupation. And his son, my grandfather, he also was a superhero because he organized and helped finance the resistance in his region. And 
Eventually, the Spanish occupiers imprisoned him for four years and then killed him. And then my Algerian grandfather was also a superhero because he escaped by foot from Mascara in Algeria to Tain in Morocco, seeking to avoid bloodshed during the French occupation. And he found peace in Morocco, but 40 days after the passing of my grandfather, uh, grandmother, at the age of 40, he died of a broken heart. And both my father and my mother never overcame the loss of their parents. So in knowing that, how can I, knowing what had happened to them and what they have lost, hold anything against my parents? War, oppression, colonialism, and broken families cause so much suffering, not only in our collective past, but also in our current times. And if we do not learn from our past and each other's experiences, this will continue to happen in our children's future. So that's lesson two, learn from each other's experience so you can overcome, understand, and show empathy. Because you otherwise only see half of the story. And then last, lesson three, your past doesn't define your future. Your willpower, your intention, and your actions do. The brave Chinese artist, Ai Weiwei, he said that art is a social practice that helps people to locate their truth. The truth itself, or the so-called truth presented by the media, has limitations. Manipulation of the truth does not lead to lack of truth. It's worse than no truth. Manipulated truths help the powerful or advance the positions of the people who publicize them. So the arts and journalistic media play completely different roles. The history of Europe's immigrants is buried away from a lost and frustrated youth. And so what I would like to say is, isn't it about time that these stories are added to the pages of history books at schools and to the lyrics of songs? So we see more than half of the picture. Progress and integration needs a starting point, but in the beginning of all healing lies struggle, obstacles, and tears. You see, I activated my superhero DNA, because that's what I have, when I left home at the tender age of 15, and I decided not to start a pity party or to give up, but instead molded my sadness into passion and my tears into melodies. And being away from my comfort zone was a big risk. It was lonely and it was hard. But it also gave me time and space to create a broader and more pluralistic perspective. It gave me time to study how the prophets practiced compassion and patience, how the poet Rumi followed his heart, how Buddhist monks create transformative mandalas, how ballerinas practice perfect pirouettes, and how Muhammad Ali floats like a butterfly and stings like a bee. Their wisdom encouraged me to work even harder. Against all odds, I overcame my childhood and having no identity, no home. And against all odds, I studied music and developed a skill set, a support network, and at 25 years old, I started my own record label, Truth Seeker Records. And looking back now at 39, because I do a lot of stuff, you can find it online, but I could have become a drug addict, I could have become homeless, or a prostitute, or a teen mom, repeating maybe history. But instead, one day at a time, God and good people groom me, and they helped me grow a thick skin, because that's what I needed to learn. And they cleared the way for me to blaze forward and to take up space. And for that, I will always be grateful. And my dream is that all of you sit down for a moment, not now, but maybe another day or next week or in a few months, and sit down for a moment and ask the person sitting next, next to you, maybe your friends or your colleagues or your parents or your grandparents, about the struggles and wars that they had to overcome. And I hope that when you think about your own struggle in life, small or big, that you can see how far you have already come with sheer willpower. We are all brave, and we all hide tears, and with music and art, we are able to rewrite our hybrid global identities. And so to conclude, my superhero story is imagination is where it all starts. Just like with the simple exercise we just started with, or with my mother who decided that if the law in Morocco was outdated and the Dutch progressive, she'd make use of the one that could change her circumstance and, and that of her, her, of her children. 
And that instilled in me a fire, which made, it, which made me an outlier at the age of 15, because I wanted to expand my horizon. And my goal now is to tell you, the next generation, to take up your space and create your chronicles and overtures in life. Here, as I said before, you are in the mecca of imagination here at Artes. Here you are enough. What you do is enough. And here you can take up space and time to mold your tears into, into uh, your tears, your struggles, your dreams, and your passions, and your ideals into art, into music, into designs, into dance that can tr transform your circumstance and that of others and of the world. And I hope you know that growing pains are signs of life. And those are the moment of popping out of your caterpillar, your, your cocoon, and that this is where the magic starts and happens, far away from the norm and from the comfort zone. So rock on, be different, draw a circle where society draws a square, be brave, and be a nice human. Thank you very much. That was Raja El Muhandis at our home event. The next item is one of the presentations by the International Student Circle. This is a new uh, project at Artes. It's just launched and it's a platform that uh, is a community of exchange students or students that are from different backgrounds. Their aim is to connect with each other and to share and create possibilities for their studies and practice internally and externally via different events. So it's not just a an, an foreign student club, but they really try to bring this being international, not as a foreign, but as students with an international perspective. And one of them is Marianne. <laughs> yes, this item is by Marianne Cortez Mereyes, who is a student at the Master Fashion Strategy. And she tells about her home country, uh, Brazil, and what it's like to make a home while being an expat. Hello, my name is Mariani. I'm going to talk a little bit of what is home for me and what was my personal journey until I find home here in the Netherlands. Um, okay, I'm 22 years old. I'm a part of the Fashion Strategy Masters in Arnhem. Right now I'm living in Utrecht. So I travel all the time with the trains <laughs> through here. Uh, I came from Brazil. Brazil is a very, very big country. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my country. People think that we are all around beaches and carnival, but it's not only that. <laughs> of course, we have that. Uh, we also, football, right? Yeah, football, of course. Uh, we have beaches. That's the beach from uh, Rio Grande do Sul, uh, Rio de Janeiro, I'm sorry. And we also have Amazonia, is the forest, forest. and the mountains. Uh, we have a lot of landca landscapes that are very different from here in the Netherlands. Uh, we have carnival. We love to party. Carnival, I don't know if you know, it is a party of four days in Brazil. It happens in all the regions in Brazil. And um, we used to say that the year only starts after Carnival and is around March, so <laughs> all this time we spend on beaches and vacation and not working. <laughs> we also have feijão, is the typical uh, meal that can reunite all the regions in Brazil. We have very different culture regions, but this meal you can find it everywhere that you go in Brazil. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> We, it's a soup made of beans, kind of a soup because it's more dense. We put por parts of pork in it. We eat with white rice and oranges and a kind of flour that is spicy. And it's a very heavy meal and a little bit of Brazilian eating habits. We have breakfast and then we have the snack of the morning. Then we have the lunch, which is always kind of a hot meal with feijão, beans, meat, salad. Then we have the snack of the afternoon, which is a little bit like coffee with milk, sometimes a sandwich or a cake. Then we have the dinner. Then it's 
uh, again, a hot meal with feijão, uh, rice, so we eat a lot. Very different from here in the Netherlands that you only eat sandwiches every time. <laughs> or salad, or soup. <laughs> But it's not even compared to the Brazilian meals. I came from Porto Alegre. I don't know, uh, anybody here knows where is it? It's in the south of Brazil. And Brazil is so, so big. I don't know if you can understand people from Europe because Europe is very, very tiny and tiny countries. But this is my state, uh, my state, yeah. We do borders with Argentina and Uruguay, and we have a lot of culture from there, from Spanish. We are known from uh, in those, I don't know if you can see, but next to the border, we have a dialect that is called Portunhol. It's Brazilian Portuguese with Spanish. It actually exists. <laughs> It's very similar, so. Uh, and to understand a little bit of the dimensions of Brazil, uh, my state is seven times bigger than the Netherlands. Mm. So it's very, 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 very big. Uh, seven times bigger. So, uh, And my city is Porto Alegre, it's the capital of the state, and it's around that lake. <laughs> uh, we don't have beaches. We have to travel three hours by car if you want to go to a beach. And frankly, the south south beaches, <laughs> they are not that nice. So if you want to go a real, real beach, it's around Santa Catarina and seven hours drive. So, and we usually do that because we are used to. Uh, this is how my city looks. It's very big. We, do, we don't have a beach, but we have a lake. And it's famous to have uh, the best sunset <laughs> in Brazil because the sun goes down in the lake. So it creates a beautiful uh, viewing of the sunset. There's a little bit of the lake towards the city. Uh, yeah, that's what I can say. We, about my, con my origin culture, like more regional, we drink shimaho. That is a kind of a tea of herbs, similar to matcha. I don't know if somebody knows it. But we drink from a cup made of a seed of a tree. And we usually share this cup around in a, a talking circle with your friends or your family. It's very traditional. People drink it every day, at least two times, three times a, a week. And it, for us, it's a little bit similar to coffee because it has a little bit of caffeine and then makes you a, a little bit more awake. We're also known about the churrasco, is the barbecue there. And we do with the big pieces of meat with a spit. And it's a, a habit of ours because every Sunday we do like a barbecue every Sunday, seriously. And usually with your whole family, not, not only your brothers, sisters, and mothers, but your whole family, cousins, uh, I don't know, dogs, every, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the meal after, and this do, do, like goes from one until seven, because usually we are known to exaggerate in the food, always have left, leftovers about the chasco, and then we cut in small pieces, And we do the carreteiro, that's another dish. So who comes from the barbecue stays for the dinner. So, mm. uh, so as you can see, we are very uh, attached to tra traditions involving the family. And I don't have my family here, so it's something that I miss a lot. I, this mm. is some pictures of my family. <laughs> this is me going to the airport. <laughs> uh, We have a big family. My mother has three sisters, and they all have children. And my dad has three brothers, and they all have children. So a lot of cousins and aunts, and yeah. I also have a lot of friends, of course. And I left all behind in Brazil to come here. <laughs> and why I came here? Um, first, because of education. I knew that I wanted to do a master's after I graduate. And I knew that uh, I wanted to do in Europe because you can travel around, know a lot of other cultures. And yeah, 
then I found the artist curriculum of Mesh and Fashion Strategies, which, which was very different from everything that I know. It's a master that criticized the fashion system and how we can do, how we can do, make changes to sustainability and how we can make more fair uh, exchanges. And I'm very into that, so that's why. And I also want like life experience. I want to travel around, have a personal growth, and uh, learn how to be more independent. Because Brazilians, they are used to, they have a different culture from the Netherlands. We used to live with your parents when you're like, until you were 25, 30. It's, uh, we take a long time to go out. So <laughs> I'm 22 and I said, okay, that's the moment. <laughs> And also, I have a boyfriend, so <laughs> I cannot lie. I, that's a part of why I chose the Netherlands. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to be an expert in the Netherlands, how it is. Uh, for me, the language is difficult, the Dutch is difficult, but 90 to 93% of the population speaks English, so I feel very welcome here. Uh, people always, they, they don't look at you with a... I don't know, immigrant eyes, <laughs> they are very welcome, almost always. So that's very nice. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities here, a uh, lot of scholarships, a lot of jobs opportunities for international. So here is very nice to be. And also the culture of the Dutch people, the Netherlands, is very funny that they are very proud to be Dutch, mm -hmm. even that if they uh, welcome the internationals. And of course, they have beautiful, <laughs> beautiful landscapes, the bike, uh, the cows, and the food, <laughs> which is very weird for me. <laughs> but, uh, well, it's nice. But when you are in touch with this culture that is so proud to be Dutch and so a uh, fan of the regional things, you kind of feel apart a lot. So, in, especially in my case, because I, uh, I have a second family now because of my boyfriend and I'm in touch with people talking in Dutch every time, uh, friends also and the culture so you have to quickly adapt um, and sometimes I feel felt apart and then homesick comes, missing family and friends, wanting a shoulder to cry when things don't go the way you want and feeling apart and feeling too different is uh, a part of being an expert. I think everybody uh, experienced that and it's something that you cannot run away. You are going to feel like this. And how can you find your home after you are insert on a different culture? Well, I have some tips or some things that help me. Is the importance of self-knowledge and importance of knowing what you want and what you feel comfortable with. Because, okay, home is where the heart is, but uh, where is your heart? Like, is it in the people? Is it in the things that you do? Is it in your house? Is it in your, I don't know, some people uh, feel comfort uh, reading a book or, I don't know. So remembering who you are and why you came here, it's very important to hold on strong and find your home and discovering what you need. And from some people, as I said before, it's a very different perspective. So for me, my home is that I need to have deep human connections. If I don't have a really good friend or uh, somebody that I can count on, for me, it's very diff difficult to find a home. For other people, they're not. But for me, it's very important. So I'm glad that I have my boyfriend here and second family. And I'm searching for friends. <laughs> Please be my friend. <laughs> and for me, it's very important to have an order and a routine. If I don't find myself in chaos of life, I get very frustrated. So for me, it's very important to have organized room and a day to do laundry, a day to do this kind of things. For me, it's very important. So I could, before I didn't know about it, <laughs> now I know. <laughs> And what's your home for me? Your home is where you make yourself comfortable. And that's it.
Thank you. That was Mariana, and this was the end of episode one of season two. Next podcast, there will be an interview with Stefan Kegi, a theater maker, and he's part of the Rimini Protocol. Diversity Stories is a podcast by Studium Generale Artes, edited by Fleur Bokhoven and Dennis Gaans, hosted by Mel Kickert and Henrik Gootjes, produced by Onderkast. Subscribe to Diversity Stories wherever you get your podcast. And if you feel like helping us, rate the podcast in iTunes.